In what may be Christopher Daniel Barnes's finest hour, we are going to be ending our discussion of Spider-Man this week here on Superhero Pantheon. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Superhero Pantheon for another week. My name is Jerome Cuson. You can find me on Twitter at Jerome C1985. You can find more episodes of this podcast on the real world. Please leave a four or five star review so as to help people discover the great work that we are doing here at this podcasting network. You can find us on at Hero Pantheon on Twitter. Uh, to give us feedback, my co host is always. Is Brian at Brian to Brain and Brian? All I can say is we have gone on a journey here, uh, talking about the mid 1990s Spider Man, and I have uh, I have not really enjoyed our discussion. Or, I mean, I've enjoyed our discussion. I always enjoy our discussions, but I haven't really enjoyed watching season five. But I have to say, I don't know whether this is because of lowered expectations. Or because, you know, we've reached the end. But I have to say that I really, really enjoyed these last two episodes. I did as well. I mean, I did enjoy the uh, the Secret Wars stuff. But again, we had those issues about the Beyonder and his motives. But I guess now we know kind of technically why the Beyonder was doing all this. Because he really needed to test this Peter Parker to make sure he was the one to save the universe. And all kinds of craziness, craziness we'll get into in a second. But... Um, yeah, so it's basically multiverse, you know, combination, a team up just like into the Spider-Verse, except it's a different cast of Spider-Man this time. But you know what? It was very enjoyable. And you mentioned Christopher Daniel Barnes in his finest hour. Probably because, I mean, it's the whole thing where he's playing six different spider man six different types of voices, six different cadences. You know what I mean? Pitch or uh, uh, voice pitching, all kinds of things, because, uh, I mean... When you got, like, Iron Man Spider standing next to, like, regular dude Spider-Man who's got no powers next to Spider-Man, there's going to be a different level of confidence between those characters. And you can tell, like, especially with Spider-Man that we see with no powers and how much his voice is so, like, low and unsure of himself compared to the Iron Man Spider that we see. So I like that little, little, little details. Like, it reminds me of... Uh, I guess Mel Blanc and doing his Bugs Bunny impressions, and I mentioned this kind of before in a different podcast, but like when Bug when he's doing Bugs Bunny impersonating like Daffy Duck at the same time, you know what I mean? The level of like talent you have to do to do an impression of an impression, you know what I mean? It's just like that kind of vocal vocal talent. I think he knocked it out of the park in this one, especially when he's the villain and doing Spider Carnage and all these different variations of Spider Man. I mean, he did a great job. Like he, like we thought that the moment that Mary Jane, you know, evaporates in his arms is like his finest hour. This whole two-parter might be even better than that because it takes a lot of talent to carry different characters and different variations of a character. So he did an excellent job, and I think this is like the best acting job I've ever seen him. I mean, what can you compare him to the Brady Bunch movies? But still, like he's been a voice actor forever. And this is the most recognizable thing, and this is the best thing out of that. So this has to be his best performance to date. I mean, I would agree. I I would say that even, even if season five has been my favorite, I think that he has been excellent. I think the the moment you mentioned with Mary Jane is really good. And here, I, th- I just think he's really stellar. Like, that's all I could say about what he is able to do with this performance. And... I I still think that season five would have been so much better if we had been able to have like a five part secret wars. And I think if this final two, if these final two episodes had been able uh, to have been separated into five parts, I think that would have been really good too, because there are just some things that, 
in this in these final two episodes that I wish I had more of a chance to breathe, and I wish we had gotten like more time with Gwen Stacy because we haven't we haven't gotten any time with Gwen Stacy, and to just bring her in is is pretty incredible. And uh, the backstory on the voice actor for that I'll get into in a second, but uh, you know we have Gwen Stacy. We bring back Uncle Ben in a really kind of shocking moment. And, you know, we kind of end, we end with him and Stan Lee. It's just like, it, just just knowing kind of what has happened to, to some of the voice performers even is, is pretty amazing. But what a, what a, what a solid way of ending things. And, uh, you know, even though it kind of ends without him finding Mary Jane, I I still ended up feeling satisfied with the journey in a way. Yeah, that makes sense because I mean, the journey that we go on with with Spider Man to find Mary Jane and the, especially with the Madam Web stuff, I mean that's like two seasons of build up to this moment. So I mean they they really paid it off, and you know it's all these moments you mentioned with the um, Uncle Ben coming back and Gwen Stacy coming back. When I was watching it, I felt this is the closest that I felt the MCU in the show, you know what I mean? Like the way that the MCU can have these magical moments when like Tobey Maguire just shows up or Andrew Garfield shows up, you know what I mean? When Gwen Stacy showed up, I felt like I was watching a Marvel movie in the theater and I was like, <gasps> like you mentioned you gasp uh, in, in the DM at a certain part. I thought it was this, but you gasp at a totally different part, which we'll get into. But for me, it was seeing Gwen Stacy and I was like, oh my God, that's right. We never saw her in the other universe. So maybe they really limited that to the high school relationship or whatever. But at the same time, it seemed like Peter didn't even recognize Gwen Stacy. So I was like, Oh my God. So this idea of the multiverse and they're really playing into it. I really love that. And then, you know, I, I don't know. I felt like showing Gwen Stacy there. I was like, Oh shit. There's like all these extra opportunities for more storylines now, but it's too late. It's too late. So I don't know if they should have brought her back when Black Cat left to make things more interesting or not even do the whole let's get married to Mary Jane storyline at all. But I think throwing Gwen Stacy in there would have made things better, I think, and shook things up a little bit, made things more interesting and hopefully get more, you know, a female, you know, character that we can focus on and not just Black Cat, you know, because you mentioned that Mary Jane never gets any love. She's just kind of this, you know, love object that gets in the way sometimes until she gets her own storyline, but it's too late at the end when she got her own storyline. So, um, yeah, I'd seen Gwen Stacy, man, was quite a quite a surprise. I absolutely thought they were gonna do a moment where they like threw her off. Like there was a moment even when they were, it seemed like they were about to throw Gwen Stacy off a roof or something. I totally thought they were gonna do kind of a callback to uh, the moment in the comics when she died, but they did not do that. So I, I guess in some ways I was kind of surprised by that, but. I think that the thing that this these last two episodes deliver on is just the promise of, you know, who Spider-Man is in a, as a person, and that's what they're paying off. I think it's it's really unfortunate to me that Mary Jane is not a full character, because then I think this then the lack of her I think means even more. But really, what this whole show has been about ultimately is, and the thing that I always believe is that when you get to when you get to the end of a series, you find out, like, what do the writers really think this show is about? And I think what you did, what you realize as a viewer is this show was always about, like, who Spider-Man is as a person and kind of his own journey. And in the end, we find that Spider-Man is is kind of his own person. And the fact that he, be, he, is, he is realized as a leader. Like you have all these Spider Man, which I think it's really interesting to me. I don't, I you know, I don't know the comic books as well, but I do know that at this point, that in terms of on screen, we have had three different, we have had three different interpretations of multiple Spider Man fighting at the same time. We've had this, which came first. We've had Into the Spider Verse, which is I think pretty famous at this point. And we, of course, have uh, what happened in Spider-Man No Way Home with the big reunification or the big unification of all three of the live action Spider-Man. So it's pretty interesting that we this was kind of the predecessor to both of those things. Ultimately, it's it is the universe of Spider-Man that we have become 
accustomed to. He is the one who is the leader. He is the one that is fully realized. And he is the one that gets all these pay- payoffs. And that's really great. Uh, I did want to mention, just before we kind of get deeply into things, uh, the voiceover performer for Gwen Stacy is Mary Kay Bergman. And Mary Kay, unfortunately, is uh, uh, committed suicide in 1999. And South Park did a lovely tribute to her in the season three finale, the Christmas episode, where they did all the... uh, they They basically turned the Christmas album into an animated episode obviously because of her unfortunate passing. Uh, but I just wanted to to mention that because uh, she is somebody who's been on a number of movies and TV shows and probably is best known for South Park at this point. But she was also Gwen Stacy in these, in this, in this, uh, in the series finale. Uh, so yeah, it was really great to see her, but just wanted to mention that. And yeah, all of the, uh, the, the first time in on screen of the multiple Spider-Man. That's probably why I felt like this was like an MCU movie or it felt very cinematic because it had a lot of those cinematic moments. But um, I guess let's kind of get into like the whole deal of it all, because when we left off, right, Beyonder said, OK, Spider-Man, you're ready for the, the real challenge now. And of course, this other Spider-Man on this other Earth uh, gets inhabited by Carnage. And from my from my understanding, it's the same carnage that was in the portal that got shot into the portal from like season four. So that is certainly possible, but here's what I want to ask you. So when Spider-Man ends up in this very dark world, knowing who the voice of the beyonder is, did you make the connection to the Terminator? No, but now that you mentioned it, (laughs) yeah, I mean, he was, I mean, the voice of the beyonder is the asshole doctor from the Terminator. So, and your connection is, I mean, that that was my connection. I was also going to make the connection to Days of Future Past. I think some of the <laughs> visuals just yeah. reminded me of Days of Future Past. And I think uh, I think they, do, they did a really good job of just making this feel apocalyptic. Um, I'm almost... It, it's probably not as good as the X-Men Days of Future Past, just because I think the animation is just overall better. But I think they did a solid job of just representing the, the hell that is New York City in... Uh, whatever universe this is. And by hell, it's like this red scape with like red wind. So whatever Spider-Man Carnage did with this like machine that he has, he made New York into this wasteland and like people are dead or whatever. And then he wants to take it even further and annihilate the entire universe and not just his universe, but every multiverse in the multiverse. So yeah, that's why the Beyond is like, hold up a second. Cause apparently uh, it did happen, but beyond a reverse time, the moment it happened, but he could only push time back so much to the point where now he needs Spider-Man to come in on the few hours before Carnage does this and save the day with a bunch of team uh, with a whole team of Spider-Man to do so. So that's pretty much the basic breakdown. Uh, I do feel like the struggle was more like more conflicting in like secret wars like the physical struggle i felt like in this one because there were so many spider-men it was easier physically but it was just more of i guess the mental struggle of trying to convince carnage not to do it and that's basically the, the real struggle which we'll get into in part two but you know in terms of like the physicality they really took care of business quick um they real, i mean they didn't really have a hard time they pretty much did they kind of almost saved the day in the first episode carnage jumps to another universe because that's what you do in a multiverse very similar to multiverse of madness uh, so he jumps to a universe another universe where it's i think it's the iron spiders universe and he mentions that he's this multi-millionaire and it's like aren't you a multi-millionaire where you come from and i'm thinking like oh they're doing the iron man thing so he's the iron man of that universe and of course that's when we reveal that gwen stacy's that his fiance uh kingpin is his lawyer quote unquote but of course Peter Parker always knows never to trust Kingpin, so he kind of that was kind of like a shady thing anyway. So we got to see Kingpin one last time doing shady shit. But uh, at the end of the day, I mean, Carnage tries to build the machine again in this other Earth, and bam, they save the day. But the way they do it is kind of this amazing moment that made Jerome gasp. And I, I remember this moment, so it wasn't like a gasping moment for me. I was more gasping at like the Gwen Stacy stuff, but like the moment Uncle Ben comes out and and carnage like becomes the, the Peter Parker of that other universe again. And it's like, uncle Ben, you're alive. And then this giant emotional moment happened that I just totally forgot. And then I just kept thinking like, God, if this was like a theater right now, full of, of packed house, 
for an MCU like Friday night movie, I think everyone would be crying right now. And that's kind of the feeling I get. But um, it was a great moment, man, because it, it was like you're alive. And then it, it was that moment that was like, OK, I can still be Peter Parker. I'm not Carnage right now until, you know, the moment where he has to kind of like save himself from Carnage. And yeah, I think they kill Carnage finally. But uh, man, that was one of those emotional moments where it's like, holy shit. What a what a way to bring a character back, even though, you know, it's, he's dead, obviously, but in this universe, he's alive. So you can play with that. And they really took that idea and, and went with it because, I mean, you watch Multiverse of Madness, Doctor Strange, and they took a lot of these ideas. But it, I don't know. There wasn't the emotional impact of Uncle Ben coming back to like on the same level. You know what I mean? It was much more emotional than any other com- like any other surprises, even Professor X in Multiverse of Madness. Yeah, I just think, I mean, we're so used to the idea of Uncle Ben being dead that the idea of bringing him alive is just almost impossible. But in this circumstance, because you're in an alternate universe, and the implication that I got from the episode is that this is one of the few universes, if not the only one, that Uncle Ben is actually still alive. And I think that's what makes it so powerful, is that... that, that you know, we have not seen, I mean, we've seen Uncle Ben a couple times because they had to explain uh, his background and kind of his origin, but to see him come back in the finale, I mean, it's just a great way of connecting things to the beginning. And I think that's what all, a, a lot of great finales, that is kind of what they do. So I just was really impressed with the storytelling of that moment and uh, just bringing him back and just the emotion. And again, the voiceover performance by, um, just by everybody involved was was really impressive to me. I mean, again, Christopher Daniel Barnes. I mean, we've talked about him a lot on this on this uh, series, and just the work that he is doing consistently is impressive. But just that moment when he is able to reunify to reunite with Uncle Ben, like it's it's really powerful. And the fact that he does reunite with Uncle Ben, like that is. I feel like that's the only thing that could make Spiner Carnage kind of off himself and, and sacrifice himself. Like, I think that specifically is something that's the only thing that could inspire him to do that. And like, that is, that is the ultimate realization of the quote with great, with great power comes great responsibility because he is not only taking responsibility but he is sacrificing himself. And I think that's, that's super powerful. And yeah, I think every Spider-Man kind of has their own unique story. Uh, they do incorporate the idea of the clones and Ben Riley. Uh, there is an infamous comic book storyline that addresses the idea of the Spider-Man clone. I don't necessarily want to get into that storyline because number one, I'm not, I don't, I'm not totally well versed in it. But number two, it's not really relevant for our conversation. But Ben Riley does play a role in this, and that's pretty amusing. And again, it's just so impressive that he feels like his own character, even though it is also voiced by Christopher Daniel Barnes. So uh, it's just really impressive. Uh, Brian, I want your thoughts. We uh, we got we got the goblins reunited again, and uh, I also appreciated that as well. Yeah, it was cool. I mean, it was fun. Uh, I, you can play with alternate universes, man. That's what I love about, you know, Multiverse of Madness. I know people hate on it, but the whole multiverse idea, you, you take that concept and you play with it. The Back to the Future concept is what I call it, man. Take it and run with it. So these ideas of like, hey, let's put the goblins together. Let's make Kingpin his lawyer. Like all that shit, you can just make it up and have fun with it, man. So I love this whole concept of bringing him back to kind of give that finale because – I mean, the last time we saw the Green Goblin was like, you know, he goes in the portal and, you know, he's now he's influencing his son to do it and all that stuff. But now it's like a different universe and they're working together with with the Hobgoblin. And we got this hat. We got to hear Mark Hamill one last time. So that was pretty cool, man. Um, It was a good way to say goodbye, I guess, knowing that these are the last episodes. Yeah, I I mean, it it had its moments. So but I think the interesting thing with the Stan Lee thing, I don't know, it just feels weird because. The idea that we're going to put a guy who's not really Spider-Man on the team, I don't know. That was kind of weird, but it was like this back, back-ended back or, you know, backdoor way to kind of introduce Stan Lee for a cameo, and I get it. So that was fine, but, uh, I mean, Stan Lee was really doing the voice work, so that was really cool. So, I mean, this is post-Mallrat, so he's probably getting that groove of getting the cameo thing, so 
it was pretty cool to see. And, and I think what from there he's going to do a cameo in like X Men and uh, Spider Man. So yeah, uh, this whole thing with the cameo with Stanley that was a nice touch. And uh, the Ben Riley thing, I don't know if you noticed too, but he's got a completely different voice for Ben Riley, which I think adds to the performance and adds to his credibility. Because at first I, I didn't even realize that it was a spot like it was a Peter Parker. I thought it was a completely different person. And then I realized, holy shit, it is the same voice, even though he's got this totally different pitch and tone for Ben Riley. Um, it's a little deeper and it's a little bit different than the normal Peter Parker voice cadence. So it's those little things, man, when you're doing like, a, you know, multiple characters, you got to change up each one a little bit. So he did an excellent job in that sense. I would agree. I think that just what he was able to do across the board, I think, is is pretty impressive. I also want to point out. They really did a great job. Jameson hated Spider-Man until the end, and that is also tremendously impressive. But I like the way that they kind of made uh, even Robbie kind of hated Spider-Man because uh, Spider-Man in this alternate universe is just completely evil. And it's uh, it was just a really it was really nice to have Jameson, even though it wasn't in a in a major role, like he was still able to play. Uh, a part of this and uh that made me really happy and uh <laughs> i love the king so there was a point and uh, not the not the version that that spider-man sees in the second part of chapter two but in chapter one there's a version of kingpin in uh we'll call it new york red and uh then kingpin is transported into another reality and just randomly ends up in jail uh, they kind of yada yada that away, that's for sure. But I, uh, I, I really like that as well. And uh, another thing that I really like about the universe, that the the Iron Spider universe, is that Aunt Anna actually likes Peter Parker. Uh, we have spent like sixty episodes talking about how she doesn't like Peter Parker, so that was also kind of a nice change. And again, I really wish that we had been able to like expand this out to five parts. Because just seeing Spider-Man, like our Spider-Man in this universe, interacting with Gwen Stacy, having Kingpin as his lawyer, Aunt Anna actually likes him. Like, I think just being able to explore that would have been super fun. So it's it's just it's it's disappointing that we will that we were not able to get more of that. And I certainly appreciate what we did get, but like to have like if we were able to really tease out the idea of Kingpin as his lawyer and kind of be able to, Oh, is he going to turn? Is he not going to turn? Like, I think that would have been super fun and have again, more of Aunt Anna and Mary Jane is kind of this fashionista is also interesting. And yeah, I, again, just being able to see uh, more of Gwen Stacy. I think we'll get some of that in the new movie coming out. It feels like with this new movie coming out, the end of the spider verse two, whatever they're calling it. And you know, they're playing with the multiverse and we're getting Spider-Man 99 and all these different things. Like there's, there's possibilities for that where Spider-Man uh, miles Morales is going to end up in another world. And they're going to have to explore that world and kind of pretend he's the Spider-Man of that world temporarily and play along the same way this Peter Parker played along. It's tropey nowadays, but it's still, it's still very useful if you want to do something like this, where it's a multiverse alternate timeline, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's good for storyline devices like these. So I get that. It's just the, uh, they had to give us those five episodes of the Russian heroes or whatever. So that was the unfortunate thing. I kept thinking in the back of my mind, I know Jerome wants more episodes and I kept thinking like, yeah, they could have cut the five episodes from the start and, and, and yeah, just do the wedding do the reveal or maybe even you know, like three episodes on this, on the spider, J uh, Mary Jane clone, then give us five episodes on secret wars. And then the rest on, you know, this, but it is what it is. They had kind of had to spit it up, but uh, definitely these two episodes felt the most cinematic. So uh, at least it ended on a high note for sure. And of course, Madam Webb famously says at the end, it's time that you finally had some happiness in your life. So let's go get Mary Jane, but we never see it. So it's assumed but it still feels, I don't know, unresolved a little bit, but I guess it, uh, it, it definitely feels unresolved. And that's, and that's really unfortunate because I mean, it's not, it's not Alf where Alf gets captured at the end. It's not quantum leap where we learn that Sam is never going to get home, but it's, it, it doesn't feel as satisfying as it should. And, you know, I think 
it's one of those things where we are so used to like every show has a definitive finale and it's like we're talking about the idea of like oh is this show gonna have a satisfying finale like back in the day shows just ended and it was kind of accepted that that was the case um I think what makes this unique is like it very clearly does end in a direction where they're apparently going to find Mary Jane and we just don't. So I I am really I, I hope that there is some way that we can pay this off. Like like if you remember like when Justice League would like end Batman Beyond, like it was kind of an unofficial ending. To Batman yeah, Beyond, that's exactly brought... what I was thinking of when you said that because they put that in the. Uh... Was it a Christmas episode they put that on? It was one of the final episodes of Justice League Unlimited, and they brought back they fucking brought back the Phantasm, which nothing has no piece of property has ever brought back the Phantasm. They brought back the Phantasm. Oh man, it was it was wild stuff. Like they really And then they revealed that the uh what's his name? Terry was the clone of Bruce Wayne yeah. and they never knew it. So yeah. yeah, that was a good twist. It was a good twist. I remember that. They could do it in the new movie. In theory, if they go to a different world and they end up in, like, the Spider-Man 94 universe and he meets the Peter Parker of that universe and he meets Mary Jane and he's like, yeah, me and Mary Jane are married now, but she had to go through, like, a portal and had to save her. If they mention that, then I think that's the closure that we're going to get. Uh, the ex- other example I'm thinking of, and I know you really are not a fan of his movies lately, but uh, Jan Salabah reboot, they had this, like, five-minute thing where it was like all the closure you wanted from chasing amy that you never realized you that wanted. was actually the only good part of that movie so yeah <laughs> but it, it gave you that closure that you never knew you wanted so it's possible they can always i mean i don't know if it's the rights issue but i mean if it's on disney plus there's got to be some kind of you know someone's got i mean look i i would what i would say is that christopher daniel barnes should have a role in the next Spider-Verse movie. I don't know w- what form that's going to take, whether it's going to be this version of Spider-Man, but I-, I just think that he has to have a role in it because in terms of animated Spider-Man, like there is nobody else that I think is more connected to it than him. And I, I, he's not, he is not Kevin Conroy. I think Kevin Conroy is iconic in terms of Batman and playing that role. I, he is certainly not that. He is certainly maybe two or three steps below, but he is a very, very memorable Spider-Man. And what he is able to do throughout this these five seasons, I think, is really, really impressive. And I think r- regardless of the shows that, again, this show has not always worked. I think there have been some, been some pretty bad episodes over the years, but I think there were also some really, really good ones as well. And I think this specifically him, Christopher Daniel Barnes was very, very consistent in his role as the lead. And that is what made the show work. I think the show was not always great, but he was always consistent. And I think that's, that's, that's what you want. That's especially what you want from your lead character. If you're getting a voiceover performance as good as this, on a consistent basis, that's what really matters because even if the show isn't firing on all cylinders, you're still getting this really good performance from him. And that's that's what sticks out to me. He's actually, I'm looking at right now really quick, he's actually done other voices in other Spider-Man work. So he's, you know. Yeah, I was looking that up as well. So yeah. he's played Electro yeah. a lot in like the animated and the video game. So that's interesting. Like he, they approached him for Electro. Um, he's played Spider-Man 99, which again, I just mentioned because he's like the main, uh, what do you call it? Uh, not hero, but he's one of the main characters, uh, guides, I guess you'd say for Miles Morales in the sequel. So you never know, man, he might just show up, not even as that character or as the Spider-Man we know and just be a different character, which is fine if they can't get the rights. But I'm, I'm looking at this and thinking of this, like if, if I'm an executive and I know how much this show has had an impact on a lot of you know, people 35 and under, let's say, right? And that's a lot of your audience. They're going to pop big for if this, if you hear the voice and you hear that voice and you see it on the screen, we're going to pop big like the way we pop for Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire. Because that that voice is so iconic as Spider-Man that it just leaps off the screen and you're like, oh my God, it's like, that's the original Spider-Man from the 90s. And I bet the whole the whole theater would start buzzing because of that. So uh, I'm very much in for that idea. If it could be the same Spider-Man, that'd be even better and kind of close that 
that storyline that we want that would marry Jane, but unfortunately we may not get that. But um, overall, I say this series is an eight out of ten. I think Batman the animated series is a couple steps above. I think this is on the same level as X Men because X Men I feel had some weird episodes in the season five, as I recall, as did this. But like I felt like it this does. Had the higher highs. This has the higher highs than lows. I don't. I I would say that I I think X Men X Men had lower lows, but I also think it had higher highs than than the show. I would say the first three seasons of X Men are some of the best some of the best animated TV that's ever been produced. And that's kind of where I'm going to stick. I would say X-Men for me, X-Men and Batman are always going to be at the top of the list in terms of like favorite or best animated TV shows. And I just think that what they were able to do on X-Men and in terms of adapting what Chris Claremont did in the, in the eighties and nineties and even back in the seventies, like just, Absolutely incredible stuff. I mean, the Phoenix storyline, Days of Future Past, like the Mister Sinister stuff in season two, like that—that that is really good stuff that I don't think Spider-Man ever really touched, and and that's and that's okay. I still think Spider-Man had some really, really good episodes, and it was just—I think it was much. It was it was a, it was a different show. I don't think that the expectations were always the same for it, and that's okay. Um, I st- I still think that it it had its moments, but uh, Batman. I I always saw Batman as more of an anthology than uh, a show with continuity, if that makes sense. So I think Batman's expectations were always different, but you know that show certainly had a lot of highs in terms of like almost got him and things of that nature. So for me, Batman and Spider Man. Batman and Spider or Batman and X Men are going to be at the top of the heap, and Spider Man is probably in in like your your tier twos in terms of animated shows. But you know, I still think it's an above average animated TV series, and I think being able to go through this the whole way through and just appreciate the storytelling, I think I I think I definitely have an appreciation for the show more so now than I did before. Because I, re- I I hadn't really seen like every run or every episode, but now that I've seen every episode, I feel pretty confident in saying it is a it's a very good it's a very good show. It's it's really really solid, and uh, overall, I really enjoyed it. I agree. And uh, really quick, I wanted to kind of wrap it up, wrap up all five seasons with my top three uh, moments because it was kind of hard to pick specific episodes because, like we said, like there's some really high highs, but then some of the episodes will have these lows and the story's not that great, but the moments are really memorable. So for me, the top three moments are number three, Enter the Punisher. At the end of the episode, we see the man spider appear. And the next episode, we don't even get Spider-Man. It's still from a different perspective. So that moment where it goes to to be continued and like as a kid when I saw that I was like holy shit like what's gonna happen next it felt like we just lost our hero so that's a moment that'll always stick with me and I always mark out every time I see it and of course it's like an ode to the horror movies of the past so good stuff there number two the mutant agenda where uh, he meets the X-Men for the first time in the danger room and Professor X doesn't stop him from fighting each other and for that moment in time we got the whole ensemble cast of the X-Men with Spider-Man on screen beautiful moment and number one, I got to go with Mary Jane evaporating into nothingness. Uh, I was like, you know, I was kind of like laying that Easter egg throughout the whole podcast before the moment happened. Months and months of build. And it finally happened, man. And my God, what a what an emotional moment. Did it was it you know, was it valid? Did it earn the moment? Maybe not. But still, like the performance just gets you emotionally, especially with Christopher Daniel Barnes. So those are my top three moments and my top three characters that are not Spider-Man. Um, of course, number one is Black Cat. Obviously, I've shown my love for Felicia Hardy and the evolution of that character and how they did a 180 with her. Number two, I'm going to go with uh, Kingpin because uh, he's a son of a bitch. And uh, I don't know. It's just like at times you want to believe that he's trying to do it for like money and not trying to destroy the world, even though his plans kind of lead to destroying the world sometimes. But this interpretation of the giant Kingpin is kind of that first visual I'll ever have Kingpin. So I'll always remember him as like this oversized monster with like this criminal background. And he's just like this gangster. Um, And then number three is kind of a tie between Connors 
Yeah, you know what? Screw it. Yeah, number three is Connors. Because, like, I felt like Spider-Man always needs, like, some kind of, like, father figure. And he was that father figure for the show. And even though he was evil, like, Spider-Man did not give up on him. You know what I mean? And that's the Spider-Man thing to do is not to give up on people. And he did that in, in Secret Wars. He did it when he turned the first time. He did it when the Lizard had his own kingdom. So he really cares about Connors, uh, Dr. Connors. And uh, we kind of got that in, even though I don't like the movies, the Amazing Spider-Man movies. But, um, you know, I think Dr. Connors should have been more of a father figure in the Sam Raimi movie, movies. But he never got to be that. I think they were kind of planning that for the fourth movie. But Because uh, I thought it was a really touching moment, even though the wedding is now annulled, I guess. But when he when they asked him to walk them down the aisle because they both don't have their dads, Mary Jane and Peter Parker. So when they ask um, Connors to to can you walk Mary Jane down the aisle and kind of give us away or give her away, I was like, wow, that's like a really mature adult thing for a show, but you know, for a kids show. Like some the kids are not gonna understand the context of that. But as an adult, especially if you lose like a parent and you're getting married, it's like that means a lot, like a lot, a lot. And something you're going to remember for the rest of your life. So I think the whole thing with Connors and saving him at the end and making him the good guy in Secret Wars, I thought that was perfect for that character. It's a shame we didn't kind of get that in the movies, even though they did turn the lizard back at the end. Uh, right, well, Fi- or Ray Fines or whatever, not Ray Fines, uh, Rice Ethan's or whatever. Um, but still, like, that was, that was still, like, B-footage from Amazing Spider-Man. But anyway, like, you know, I really hope in the next movie that maybe – he finds Dr. Connors in this universe, Tom Holland, and we build that relationship because he needs a father figure right now. And there's no more Dr. Strange. There's no more Tony Stark. His friends abandoned him kind of. So he's all alone. So he's going to need that guiding light. And I hope Dr. Connors becomes that. Yeah. I really like the use of Dr. Connors here as well. I don't think he's nearly used as well in amazing Spider-Man or in Spider-Man no way home. But I, I, I just think there is a depth to that character that I uh, really appreciate, and I don't think that they were ever able to to top with any other version of that character. And I think it's really easy to classify Lizard as just like this generic kind of B-villain, like uh, a Scorpion, for example, who I can't stand, but I, uh, I would agree with you that Connors is a really good one. Kingpin was always the A-villain for me. Even more than Doc Ock, I feel like I feel like Doc Ock is kind of quote unquote supposed to be Spider Man's number one villain, but to me, it always felt like it was Kingpin. Like especially with the voice work, just it was always Kingpin. Like he was always at the top of the heap. And I I I like Black Cat as well. I just think this show I think this show would have been even better if Mary Jane had been a full character. Like, I would love to watch the version of the show where Mary Jane is an actual character and not just a love interest. I think that, to me, fundamentally changes the nature of the show. And I would just, I would love to see what it looks like with with an actual Mary Jane. And I think for me, that's always going to be the thing that, that kind of holds me back from fully appreciating this as like the number one show or like the best show. But uh, yeah, overall I, I'm not sure I would say this as high as you, but I, uh, I definitely appreciated what we were able to do here in just kind of breaking this show down and really examining it because uh, we've never really had a chance to do this with the show. We've certainly gone over just about every, every superhero movie at this point. Uh, but we haven't had a chance to do it uh, with TV, so yeah, this was a this was very different for our approach to a superhero pantheon, and I think this really worked as kind of a side project and uh, kind of a means of giving us something to do in these uh, in these months of transition, especially for me. But uh, now we will need to find something else to do, and uh, we'll be transitioning and uh, and doing something else as. Uh, I think we're going to be making a pretty drastic change very soon. Uh, once we get through the uh, through the month of November, which I uh, I think uh, I think Brian I think I uh, would like to take a bit of a break uh, for a couple weeks before we do our big Black Panther episode. Uh, that is that's going to be our finale. Are you are you excited uh, for Black Panther two? 
I'm excited, and uh, I guess I'm gonna have to bring a box of tissues, man, because even watching those two trailers, I'm getting like emotionally broken up. But I think Kevin Feige kind of said it best. We're like, we're still grieving, and I guess that's what it is. So I guess I gotta respect them for that for kind of being on, being knowing what's up and kind of knowing the world is still grieving for Chadwick Boseman. So. That's kind of the approach you're taking. What what if Fast and the Fear what if Fast and the Furious Seven, the last ten minutes of Fast and Furious Seven was two hours? That's what this movie is. <laughs> well, hopefully it's better because I remember that fast movie falling asleep and uh, How just, how dare you? That movie is very good. I woke up at the right time when I saw the goodbye for Paul Walker, but there was that thing with like the the, the parking structure thing, right? That was the finale, right? It was a very emotional moment. Um, okay. Fast Eight is really terrible, but Fast Seven is very good. I would Maybe say, what I'm thinking in of. terms I, I of the Fast up, movies, but... it's it's above average. I know I've skipped some, but they all kind of end up the same anyway. But really quick though, as we kind of close this out, I wanted to kind of uh, kind of add some little notes here. Like we've been kind of like theorizing some of the things that were they were allowed to do and not to do. So I kind of <laughs> found this official list really quick uh, for the Spider-Man show. So Spider-Man never punches anyone. Did you notice that? I did not notice that. Yeah, so, uh, and no realistic weapons are allowed. That's why we got a lot of lasers. They can't use the word die, death, or kill, so Uncle that's, Ben. I mean, not. that's pretty That's pretty consistent with X-Men, I believe. Yeah, and uh, Carnage, they never mentioned that he's a serial killer, which I totally forgot anyway, which is a good thing, probably. Um, and then, uh, that's pretty much it. Oh, the, the Morbius stuff we were right on. Morbius can't say blood, he can say plasma. Everyone else could say blood, and he couldn't, and then that's why he had the suckers, because he couldn't be shown biting people's necks, so that's why he had the things on his fingers. Of course. And, yeah. Um, and then, you were right about the Sinister Six, because they renamed it the Insidious Six, because Mr. Sinister was on X-Men at the time, so you were right about that. And uh, another weird note is that they never broke any windows and show, or ever showed broken glass, so... There you go, kids. Little things you didn't know. That is didn't that a know. is that a broken window New York thing? I don't even. I don't know, man. Because when I read that, I was like, "Is that is that true? Is that like, do they not want kids like breaking windows at home, or is that what it is?" Or it's weird stuff, man. This weird little rules. But there you go. We were theorizing it, and we were kind of right on all of them. And I think the biggest one that we were right on is Jerome with the Mister Sinister thing. So. Credit to you for that one, and uh, yeah, that's kind of how we wrap up the Spider-Man show. All right, so we will be back in a couple of weeks to discuss Black Panther. On that episode, we will have other things to talk about, and we will also we will also announce what we are doing uh, for the month of December. So we are going to take a couple weeks off. We're going to come back for Black Panther. We'll take a couple more weeks off, and then we will be back in December. Uh, with something very special, uh, holiday-related. Brian and I have some ideas. Uh, oh, ho, ho. Oh, ho, ho. <laughs> it's going to be very fun. So, yes, Brian and I will be doing some Christmas things. And then in January, we will continue on with Pantheon Plus and uh, some various themes, some different ideas that we will be coming across. So, for Brian, my name is Jerome. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, and especially thank you for listening to us as we went on a journey here talking about Spider-Man. We will talk to you again in a couple of weeks. God, I really hope Morbius and Blade killed his mom because, yeah, I really hope Blade killed his mom. <laughs>